sorry. There we go. Here it is. The last video. Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes. Illustrated by Lind Ward. Published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Thank you, Esther Forbes, for such a great story. This is chapter 12. A man can stand up, and it will be the last section. In section four, Rab and Johnny get to visit. Uh, Rab is not well. He has been shot. He's sitting in a chair, and Dr. Warren is caring for him. He can still talk, but he does have blood in it coming out of his mouth a little bit. Um, but he's able to talk, and he gives Johnny his gun. And he's being tough right up now till Johnny is leaving the room. And they had a good, quick conversation, but Rab is not doing well. And that's right now, Johnny leaves the room. Section five. Rab had told um, Johnny to go to Silsby's Cove and tend to his family out there. So Johnny is headed out there. So here we are, section five. At Silsby's Cove, there were no women, children, or farm animals about, except a couple of weaned calves in the calf pasture. When the warning came, it had probably been decided they were too hard to catch and cart. Johnny looked at the deserted barn. Hens were about. They could live for days on the spilled oats and rye. There were two dogs who came up to him, telling him they had not been fed. I'll bet they took you with them, said Johnny. And you sneaked back home, eh, boys? The cat stuck close to him. It was a big orange tom, and Johnny knew it was Grandsire's favorite. It was mewing and rubbing about him. He picked it up. You wouldn't be bothered to go out and catch a mouse in the barn like the other cats, would you? He said. But if Grandsire had not gone away to hide like the other non-combatants, he wondered why he had not fed the animals. He entered the old house, which was unlocked. The tom, confident that now he would be fed in the elegant way he was accustomed to, began to knead his paws, and his purring grew hoarse with triumph. Grandsire, Johnny called. There was no answer, and the red armchair where the old gentleman usually sat since his game leg had grown so bad was empty. Major Silsby was not there. Johnny went to the larder and found bread and sour milk for the animals. He welcomed this small duty. It kept him from thinking. The tom he fed in the kitchen. The basin of food for the dogs he put in the yard. Where? Where? Where was the old gentleman? Suddenly, he had an idea. And he ran back into the kitchen and looked over the hearth. Grandsire's old gun was gone, and so was the powder horn he had carried to Lewisburg back in 1745, and so was Grandsire Silsby. Johnny walked back to the village, his head bent and his hands in his pockets. A numbness, half emotional, half physical, was stealing up through him. His feet felt like lead. His mind seized upon little trivial things, like that orange tomcat of Grandsire Silsby's. He noticed a jubilant little girl with a grenadier bearskin hat on her head, half over her face. He could not help but notice the regimental number on the cap. The grenadier, likely dead by now, had been a soldier of the tenth. He saw Dr. Warren's chaise before Buckman's tavern. In the lower entry, Dr. Warren was waiting for him. Rab? The doctor dropped his eyes. Sometime, he said, we will know how to stop bleeding like that. We don't now. He sent me away because he knew he had to die? Yes, he knew. Dr. Warren moved into the empty parlor of the inn, away from the noisy group in the tap room, telling over and over of their great deeds. There's no need for you to go upstairs. Johnny nodded. He had moved off into a strange, lonely world where nothing could seem real, not even Rab's death. The woman of the inn came in on tiptoe. She had a tray of food for the doctor. Tired out, the young man sank into a chair, his fair, bandaged, aching head in his hands. You remember that night, he said, that last meeting of the observers? James Otis came. 
although we didn't want him. I can't remember much of what he said, but I remember how his words made the goose skin on my arms. I'll never forget it. He said, so a man can stand up. Yes, and some of us would die, so other men can stand up on their feet like men. A great many are going to die for that. They have in the past. They will a hundred years from now. Two hundred. God grant that there will always be men good enough. Men like Rab. The quiet woman came in again. She had tossed up an omelet for the doctor and silently put it before him. Will you go up and fetch down the musket from the back chamber? He asked her. She nodded and did as he asked. Dr. Warren began to eat as doctors will, even under greatest strain. Can't you eat, boy? Not yet. Try and get some sleep. No. Johnny was on his feet pacing about the room. He was too stunned to feel much now. Later, he thought, tomorrow, the next day. Then I'll know that Rab is dead, but it can't hurt me now. But next year, all my life. His eye caught on the musket. He took it up, holding it close to the light of the window, fingering and examining it to see those improvements Rab said he had made on it. Rab had not taken one shot with it on Lexington Green. Never had a chance. Dr. Warren was standing beside him. Johnny, put down that gun. Here, by this window. Lay your right hand down like that, so. Johnny felt no more shame over his burned hand. He did as the doctor bade him. He felt the cool, clean hands bending his fingers, twisting his thumb until he gritted his teeth. Johnny, that hand is not as bad as you think. Burned, wasn't it? Yes. As you stood there holding that gun, it was the first time I've had a good look at it. Was it kept flat while healing? No. I suppose your master called in some old herb woman to care for it. A midwife, yes. Bah, those midwives. Any doctor in Boston would have known. You see, the thumb is pulled about like that, not because of any basic injury, but by scar tissues. What do you mean? I mean that if you have the courage, I can cut through the scar, free the thumb. My hand, good and free once more? I can't promise too much. I don't know whether you can ever go back to your silver work, but not even Paul Revere is going to make much silver for a while. Will it be good enough to hold this gun? I think I can promise you that. The silver can wait. When can you, Dr. Warren? I've got the courage. I'll get some of the, those men in the tap room to hold your arm still while I operate. No need. I can hold it still myself. The doctor looked at him with compassionate eyes. Yes, I believe you can. You go walk about in the fresh air while I get my instruments ready. Johnny stood upon the green and looked about him. He heard a woman calling, chick, 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 from a nearby cow shed. He heard milk spurting into a pail, a tap of metal on metal. His trained ear told him a gunsmith was at work. He could smell turned earth and gummy buds and sweet wood somewhere burning. His nostrils trembled. Almost could they recapture the gunpowder of yesterday. So fair a day, now drawing to its close, green with spring, dreaming of the future, yet wet with blood. This was his land, and these his people. The cow that lowed, the man who milked, the chickens that came running, and the woman who called them, the fragrance streaming from the plowed land and the plowman. These he possessed. The skillful hands of the unseen gunsmith were his hands. The old woman throwing stones at crows who cawed and derided her was his old woman, and they his crows. The wood smoke rising 
from the home hearths rose from his heart. He felt nothing could hurt him on this day, not Rab's death, nor the surgeon's knife. He felt free, light, unreal, and utterly alone. Tomorrow. Next day. It would be different, but today is today. Then, far away, but coming nearer and nearer down along Monotomy Road, he heard the throb of a drum, men coming back from Charlestown. He stood, turned his head to listen. The shuffle of feet. A fife began to toot. It was ill played. Maybe a foolish tune, but Johnny warmed to hear it. For once, once more, Yankee Doodle was going to town. Everywhere else in the village was silence. The music, small as the chirping of a cricket, filled that silence. Down the road came twenty or thirty tired and ragged men. Some were blood-stained, no uniforms, a curious arsenal of weapons. The long horizontal light of the sinking sun struck into their faces and made them seem much alike. Thin-faced in the manner of Yankee men, high-cheekboned, un alterably determined. The tired men marched unevenly, but Johnny noticed the swing of the lithe independent bodies, the set of chin and shoulders. Rab had been like that. Please, God, out of this New England soil, such men would forever rise up ready to fight when need came, the one generation after the other. Close on the heels of the marching men was an old chaise containing their commanding officer, for if you couldn't get to the fight on foot, you went on horseback, and if not on horseback, you went in a chaise. It was Grand Sire Silsby, with his old gun across his knees. Johnny started to run to him to shout, Grand Sire, Grand Sire, you haven't heard yet. Rab is dead. But he knew the old major wouldn't stop. He had to get his men on to Cambridge and the siege of Boston. True, Rab had died. Hundreds would die. But not the thing they died for. A man can stand up. The end.